Hello and welcome to Talking Till Dawn. I'm Michael Whitehouse, but you can call me Mike, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by my partner in true crime and other strange occurrences, the mighty, the mesmerising, the master of mysteries himself, Mr. Martin Yates. Martin, how the hell are you? Good evening. I'm fine, how are you? I'm absolutely dandy. Really excited. It's great to be back. Flying solo is fun, but not literally, I don't like to fly, <laughs> if I can help it. But traversing the dark and uncanny topics we do here just isn't the same without you, mate. So it's great to be back together. Great to be back. Great to be back. It must be almost a year since we've done this. Yeah, I think we were saying that. I think there was one earlier this year. We've skipped spring and summer at least. Yeah, we were just we hibernating in the spring and the summer. Had, we? <laughs> when, <laughs> the dark, when the dark begins to creep back in, we, we come out of our little bubbles. <laughs> so in this episode, we are delving into a true and tragic double disappearance that took place on Halloween. But before we do, I wanted to give a personal shout out to all of our patrons who have signed up for our Patreon page and help to keep the lights on here at the cabin. So a huge thank you to Michelle, Blue Feather Earring, Echo Lee, Deborah, Dave, Roy, Jane, Ross, Elise, Hugh, Riley, Joe, Heterag, John, Marcy, The Alias Jones, Luke, See You There, Boxing Wolf, Victor, Ty, Sarah, Bella Donich, Meat Juice, Tyler, Susie, Chug, Yuktail, Fault, Diane, Jeff, Nina, Ratchbox, Stephen, Nikki, Monique, and Damien. If I missed anyone out, my apologies, and just let me know on Patreon. Mike, you can take a breath now. You can breathe. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for all your support. It really means a lot. Yeah, it's humbling to have so many fantastic people support the show. And if you want Talking Till Dawn to hopefully increase our release schedule to three podcasts a year, no, I'm only joking, hop over to our Patreon and sign up and you'll get bonus episodes occasionally some behind the scenes info and regular communication with us at the show you can find our patreon at patreon.com forward slash talking till dawn or follow the links in the show notes below we know times are tough and we don't want anyone donating to our patreon unless you're absolutely okay to do so so if you aren't able to contribute to the patreon leaving a review of the show on your podcast app of choice is massively helpful and we really appreciate that but just so you know, the less money we get, the more gruesome the cases will be. So I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the less money we make, the more we'll make things up. <laughs> the more we'll just <laughs> muddy the waters. And you'll not know what's true and what's not. Right, Martin. So shall we dance once more, sir? It is October after all, and it would be remiss of us to not mark the creepiest month of the year. I've actually just drank a bottle of mead, so I'm not going to be doing any dancing. Um, oh well. I also painted a fence, so I think I'm I'm well and truly like excused from any dancing. But I am I'm here for this. I'm here for for talking until dawn. In fact, yes, I'm here for that. And the clocks go back tonight, Martin. So it's an extra hour. It's an extra hour of talking. Here we go. In front of you, my friend. Here we go. For all of you listening with us, this episode will describe difficult topics such as kidnapping, death, child abuse and serial killing. So if you feel like this will affect you adversely, as we always say here, look after yourself. Don't feel bad if yeah. you want to skip this episode. I do that myself when these topics start to weigh on me. Sometimes it's nice to take a break from the darker side of things and remind yourself of the light. With all that said... Let's get started. Let's get into the darkness again. <laughs> I know. With all that said, let's get into the bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take you back then, Martin, to October 31st, 1969. We are in the town of Oscoda, Michigan, with a current population of little over 900 people. The town sits at the mouth of the Sable River as it leads into the giant Lake Huron, one of the great lakes of North America. The town is quiet surrounded by deep forests that stretch for miles. It's the type of place where people can hunt, camp and enjoy the outdoors, and it should be a peaceful part of the world. Despite this, however, there have been a number of disappearances and murders in the area of which, given the size of the population, seem to me at least to be more than you would expect. Looking at the census or Skoda, I'm now wondering about the pronunciation of that. <laughs> That's going to be like you saying Oscoda is going to be like when people come here and say Glasgow. Glasgow, isn't it? I know. Edinburgh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Someone out there yeah, is cringing. So I, but I think it's Oscoda. I think you're right. I think you're right. 
Apologies to anyone if I mess up the pronunciation of anything here. So looking at the census, Oscoda has never really grown much, usually keeping its population below 1,000. And so when not one, but two girls go missing at the same time, that deeply impacts such a small, close-knit community. It also brings with it a raft of questions, given that multiple simultaneous abductions or murders are exceptionally rare. Most predatory or even opportunistic killers wait until their victims are alone. It's much less dangerous that way. It's a strange case, which as I've dug deeper, has revealed some startling and unnerving speculations in my mind. I'm not going to say that these speculations are infallible, but I do think they are worth considering. And that by considering them, we might just uncover what happened to Patricia and Pamela that terrible day. I'm very curious at what Detective Mike has uncovered here. That's, that's I have. Very, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hear I, this. I'm wearing a deerstalker hat and <laughs> nothing else. In a Skoda in 1969, Halloween fell on a Friday. That meant one thing, parties. Of course, Halloween is a big thing in America anyway. A gift from Scotland, you're welcome everyone. Is it? But is it originally from Scotland? The name is, the name is... Right. The name's a, it's, a, it's a Scottish word, but there's debate about whether it was Irish or Scottish. I'm claiming okay. it, man. Well, I mean, Hallow, Hallow's, Eve, Hallow's Eve, I suppose, would be Scots, right? It makes sense. That it would either be English yeah. or Scots. There's a lot of overlap between ourselves and the lovely Irish, but I feel like... And the English, those beautiful... Michael. Don't. I know, the, I know, you know, no, I know how you feel about English, but look, you know... Let's... That is not true. I, that is not true. How dare you? Okay, I'm sorry. We don't how talk about that in the podcast. Okay. How, how dare you? I love everyone, especially everyone here in the British Isles, okay? And across the water in Ireland. Don't especially, start fighting, I know what. But yeah, so there's debate about whether Halloween exactly where it originated, but the, the word is Scottish. And just as an aside, when you go trick or treating, we call it guising. Mm -hmm. And one of the ideas about where that word comes from is that we used to believe that the, the dead would rise on the 31st of October and the children should dress up as the dead mm -hmm. so that they would kind of blend in with the ghosts and mm -hmm. the spirits so that they wouldn't be taken. I always heard it was like to do with scaring off evil spirits in the same yeah. way that like gargoyles were Could supposed be. to scare off evil influences from buildings that like if you dressed up as you know a scary monster then it would scare the real monsters away and then you wouldn't have to worry about bad luck yeah or whatever i don't know i mean that but that was just what i heard in primary school yeah i know in uh, japan there's places where they, they dress up not on halloween but where they they dress up and wear like kind of grotesque masks to scare off spirits and things like that. I know that, that that's a tradition in parts of that country. But anyway, as I said, in 1969, Halloween fell on a Friday. I'm certainly, I don't know about you, Martin, but when I was a kid in Glasgow, the best Halloweens were those that fell on a Friday or Saturday, but mm. because it meant the kind of rules of the parents relaxed a little, you were allowed to stay up later yeah. and watch more horror films, ha maybe have some friends stay over, or perhaps even to go to a Halloween party if you were old enough. And I'm sure the same applies to our friends that are across the pond. I don't think I've ever actually been to a Halloween party. You know that? Like an actual, you know, like you see in movies, you know, like when they have Halloween mm -hmm. parties and there's like mm -hmm. 70 people in one house all dressed up as like yeah. different costumes. Don't think I've ever been to something like that. Well, maybe when I was a student, but really like the costumes were pretty much secondary, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's been a, a shift in Scotland where it's Halloween has become much more popular again and you do see things like that going on a lot more. I mean, I remember when, like yourself, like you're talking about kind of your student years, like going to parties in like my twenties. Yeah. But as a, as a teenager, my house was probably one of the only places that, that we knew of where we, we didn't have like full big parties, but I could have like a bunch of friends over and we made a big deal about it and dressed yeah. the house up and stuff like that. Like, like when I was a student, it was like, I would, you know, you're at parties every week. So the one that fell on Halloween, sometimes people would show up wearing a pair of cat ears or something like that. But that was about the yeah. extent of it, you know. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, when I was a kid, one year I went out on Halloween trick or treating or guising, as you say, and my mum dressed me up as a mummy. I begged her, can you make me a mummy? I really want to be a mummy. It'll be dead easy. You just wrap mm. me in bandages. So she's like, right, okay. She wrapped me in bandages, I think probably straight from the first aid box. By about the third house, they were falling off because like you need to like you need like plaster bandages and these were just like wrap around bandages that she'd found in the house so yeah. i remember like going out these are falling we went to my friend's house and uh his big sister was there 
slightly older, like slightly older than us, and she was like, "Oh yeah, Martin, great costume." And at that moment, I was like, "Right, it's coming off, fucking <laughs> pulling off this uh, mummy costume." And I, I just like wrapped little bits of the bandages around my arms and like head. I'm like, "Right, I'm an injured person now," and I went round about <laughs> twenty five houses just with a couple of shitty bandages wrapped around various parts of my anatomy. So you ruined all your mum's good work. I, well, the good work was falling out. It wasn't good work. That was the problem. I, I fully blame oh, it. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference. I still, you still get sweet. It doesn't matter. You show up, at, you can show up with no costume on somebody's house. And if they've, you know, what are they going to do? Yeah. They're going to chase you away with a broom. Yeah. There was a few times where people have come to my door and I'm like, you look about 18. <laughs> <laughs> and you're coming here for, so you're coming here, you come here for my sweets. The truth <laughs> was, you were 30. Yeah. So because, Halloween in 1969 fell on a Friday. There would be parties and things like that. And 16 year old Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley, 15, were supposed to be going to a party of their own that 31st of October in 1969. That much seems certain. They were to attend their high school that day on the outskirts of a Skoda and then go to the town's homecoming game. After that, they were to attend a Halloween party but not going together. And then come home and fall asleep safe and sound in their beds, having had a great end to October. Fate, it seems, had other intentions for them. Before the end of their school day, both girls cut classes. They skipped out of school in the afternoon and started to walk along a stretch of road known as River Road. This is a 2.5 mile route that leads into the heart of Escoda. On one side of it is the Aw Sable River, which runs to Lake Huron nearby, and on the other is the deep forest of Michigan State. Both girls' families expected them home later after the party, but when Pamela's boyfriend, who she was recently engaged to, spoke with her family later that night, and informed them that she had never appeared at either the homecoming game or the Halloween party, it was worrying news. She was missing, and it soon became apparent that Patricia was missing too. Local law enforcement was informed and both families, along with members of the community, began searching for the girls. Because both girls had been rumoured to have had experimented briefly with psychedelic drugs and could have been rebelling against their parents and authority figures in the 1960s no hi i know who would have thought it? i thought they were all home eating cookies and the legal kind <laughs> because there had been rumors that both girls had enjoyed going out and partying and things like that the idea spread that they could have been just rebelling against their parents and authority figures so law enforcement initially concluded that they had simply run away together this was not unheard of especially during the 60s and so it was assumed that the girls had left town and were probably far away by then. Hopefully they would be picked up at some point and if not, it was simply another story of runaways severing all ties with their lives and going somewhere else. In fact, there was a rumour that they were heading to Flint, Michigan for some reason. At one point, local law enforcement were looking to speak with a man who was a musician from Flint. Perhaps he had travelled through the area and, enamoured by him, the girls had decided to run off and, and find him. But the families and friends of Patricia and Pamela were not convinced. By all accounts, their relationships with their families were strong. After all, they could hardly have been seen as controlling, given that they allowed both girls to go out to parties on Halloween. Of course, most families will say that they have few problems in public, but there hasn't been any suggestion in the community as far as I'm aware, that there were issues there. There seems little suggestion that the girls would have run away from their families, but then perhaps they ran towards something instead. Sure, I mean, like, I think, I feel like almost at that time, less so than, to, than today, you, all, you almost didn't need to be running from something. If you think about that mm. era, that's kind of like the peak of the hippie era. People running away from home and yeah. going and join, joining communes and stuff. And it's like, maybe all those people had something they were running from, but I don't think they all did. I think I think it was, I don't want to say there was like a trend for running away from home, but it, it was definitely a thing to leave home and disappear across country. And they didn't have, you know, mobile phones and email and stuff. I feel like that era is it's hard to kind of 
compare to today in terms of what what like when people would disappear i i, I don't think that, i'm not saying these girls disappeared and refused to contact their parents for no reason but it is different to now you know you know what i'm saying yeah it wouldn't it might not have raised as many eyebrows and that may have been why law enforcement at first didn't take it yeah all that seriously exactly it was so widespread then compared to now like now yeah. if you want to leave your folks you disappear and you send them a whatsapp and they still don't know where you are but you can tell them look i'm fine i've i've gone away i'm sick of this place in those days you either had to speak to them directly which maybe you wouldn't want to if you were ditching them or you write them a letter which is a lot of work and you know people you know there was a there was a whole kind of subculture of runaways in, in those times so yeah when each family searched the girls rooms they found that they had taken nothing they hadn't packed any bags no luggage or clothes were missing no sentimental items either in fact they hadn't even taken their purses or ids if they were to run away then surely these were things they would have taken especially if it had been planned in advance yeah time passed and the trauma for the families was unbearable they had no idea where their girls were and it was almost as if they had vanished into thin air leaving no trace at all hmm. i can't imagine going through something like that as a parent you dedicate yourself to protecting your kids for the hobbly and spencer families this then was a nightmare from which they never awoke. Over 40 years have now passed since that terrible day and still no one knows what happened to Patricia and Pamela. Rumours have swirled around as they always do, especially in small communities, but we can't discount them either as simple hearsay. But before we look at those, let's do our best to retrace the girls' steps in greater detail. Although I've got no access to the police files, I have found several instances of people posting online who either lived in the surrounding areas at that time or have supposedly spoken to family members who did. I've also sourced a lot of information from newspaper articles and updates on missing persons websites such as the Charlie Project. This has filled out some of the available details, but of course there's always the possibility that rumours especially introduce errors into the case that wouldn't have otherwise been there. So moving forward here, it's best that we keep that in mind. Starting earlier in the day on the 31st of October 1969, there was one claim made that the high school fire alarm system was triggered in the afternoon. The school students and staff evacuated the school while it was searched and made safe. The Daily Mail later reported that it wasn't a fire alarm that cleared the school, but rather a bomb threat Christ. that someone had called it in. There seems to be a little disagreement about whether it was a fire alarm or bomb threat, depending on the source. A bomb threat might have precipitated a fire alarm though, because if someone phones in a bomb threat, right. How are you gonna how are you gonna empty the building? You're gonna I a suppose fire alarm. someone just shouting bomb. <laughs> someone run around go bomb, bomb. <laughs> it was during this episode, so one anonymous person living in the town claims that Patricia and Pamela walked away from the crowds and left the school behind. It's possible then that the two girls began chatting while outside and for some unknown reason decided to take the opportunity and leave the school without others noticing. The question is, did they have somewhere to go in mind? Or were they simply two high school kids who decided it would be more fun to walk home than sit in class for a couple more hours once the fire alarm was switched off and the building was shown to be safe? It also makes me wonder if they or an unknown third party could have switched on the school alarm deliberately mm. so that once outside they could sneak away and go somewhere. If it was a bomb threat then you would have to rule out Patricia and Pamela being the ones who called it in but that would not rule out an unknown third person doing so to get the girls out of school. Yeah. Do you know who the source of this information about the bomb threat or the, the fire alarm was? Was it other students at the school? Was it staff? Was it was it just a newspaper report or Yeah, so what's what's happened is that over the decades there seems to be no kind of movement on the case, and then you'll get a few newspaper articles that simultaneously go to a few different news outlets. Mm and uh the most recent most of the recent ones were kind of around about the 2010 yeah to 2014 
I think around about that era. So like there's been, I've seen it mentioned in a couple of newspaper articles. I've seen it mentioned on various websites where people are talking about the case. And as yeah. I said before, there are people who have then logged on to these websites who claim to actually come from the town or have relatives who went to the high school right. when Patricia and Pamela were there. And then they've conveyed something that's not been widely reported in the press. But of course, you can't verify that. But I'm including it, as, as I said, I'm including it because I think some of the details might be important, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it sounds legit, like if it's coming from multiple different sources. It's just interesting in terms of whether it was a, a it was a, a bomb scare or a fire alarm. And because, for example, a student, if there was a if there was a bomb alert and someone phoned into the school office and said, there's a bomb in the school, I'm going to blow the school up. They might just pull the fire alarm to get the building emptied. Yeah. So you might get someone who worked in the office at the school saying there was a bomb scare. And you might get a student at the school saying there was a fire alarm and that might then explain the, the inconsistency between those. Yeah, there's a little bit of confusion because it's, it's essentially the same thing. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Interestingly, I found an old post online where someone claiming to be the niece of a woman who went to school at the same time as the girls had some new information. Allegedly, the woman forged letters for the girls to be excused from class early. I've seen no mention of this in the press or anywhere else. Where did you get that from? Sorry. I'll, I'll refer to that later on. Right, but it's, okay. There's a website called Web Sleuths where people basically go over cold cases and people kind of chime in with different theories and things like that. And in the thread for this case, there were a few people who claimed to be kind of either directly or indirectly connected to Oscoda and even the girls. But this person said that her aunt told her that she had forged letters so probably from their parents to get them excused that day to get them out so it's difficult to know which story is correct you'd think it'd be widely known about those letters uh, mm. i would certainly leave us to believe then that the leaving of school was planned however with all due respect to the police officer investigating at the time because it was assumed initially that both girls were runaways i mean the police there's been the suggestion that they had little experience of kidnappings and things like that that um there have been claims that the investigation was haphazard initially and yeah. overlooked critical evidence at the time that might be why some things didn't reach the sort of public sphere plus it depends when that information came through about that person writing those letters for the girls because if this this being a well-known case there's always people that try and insert themselves into investigations and might go, oh, yeah, I was someone, I was involved, I wrote letters for the girls. You know, you don't know the sort of background to that. If it's a well-known case and it's assumed that the girls ran away, then someone might run with that assumption and say, yeah, I was involved in the girls running away. When maybe the girls didn't run away. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, Yeah. And I mean, like you say, even today, there'll be people just online trying to insert themselves into... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Was that on this website that you saw this? That was, on this, that was on this website where... Essentially what had happened was there was a thread for this case. It goes across years where this thread has existed. And then there's links to all this in the show notes. Uh, there's a lot of sources for this episode, but the web sleuth stuff's there and you can go to that thread and read through it. And it is really interesting. And there's a number of people who maybe have like family members or someone just heard a little bit about the case, but then they, they when they Googled it, they found this thread and people are kind of every few years jumping back in saying, oh, is there any word? Is there any development about the case? And yeah. then people start sharing articles that have been produced and statements by the police and things like that. So it's actually been a great resource for putting this episode together. But as you say, there's no way of verifying all the stuff that's been said in it. And of course it could, other than the police perhaps being inexperienced or doing things in a haphazard way, it could simply be that the police officers exhausted all areas of inquiry and, and the trail just eventually went cold. And that's why certain things just there weren't updates in the press and things like that. So this stuff might be in the police files mm -hmm. about the case. It's maybe not necessarily the sort of place where the cops are dealing on a regular basis with runaways and murders and disappearances and that kind of thing. That's the suggestion that's, that some people have made. Returning to the girl's last verified whereabouts, River Road, it was a certainly a rural road, but it wasn't a lonely stretch where cars wouldn't pass by regularly. It was one often driven along 
by residents in the area. They would use it to go back and forth between the houses on the outskirts of town and in the wider area and the centre of Oscoda where groceries and other supplies could be bought. Since the girls were last seen close to the school, you would think that other drivers would have noticed two young high school girls walking a couple of miles into town that day, especially if it's a small community and everyone kind of knows each other. But at first, it appeared that no one had seen them beyond that point. At least that was the official line from the police. Law enforcement eventually believed that the girls were picked up by someone on the road and taken somewhere else to account for them not mm. being seen. But if there was a driver, was this a chance meeting, a stranger, or someone they knew, or perhaps the girls waited by the side of the road along from the school to be picked up by a specific person or group, perhaps even the person or people they left school to go and meet up with in the first place. Was that an assumption or was that something they had actual evidence for, or did you find? Like, in terms of the police saying, we think they were picked up, you could expect the police to make that assumption, but did they actually have evidence of that? Or am I skipping ahead here? See, there's, the, the problem with this is that there, there are issues with investigation because for decades it was assumed that no other witnesses had come forward. However, in 2013, after then, Oscoda police chief Mark David reopened the case and tried to find a new lead. A witness finally came forward. The unnamed man stated clearly that he had both picked the girls up on the road and then dropped them further down towards town at a gas station. For an undisclosed reason, the police chief does not believe the man is a suspect. Remarkably, the witness said he was puzzled that the police didn't know about him picking up Patricia and Pamela because he claims that he had come forward decades ago. It's funny because this is this this is something that you find time and time again in disappearance and murder and serial murder investigations all across the world. Like you, you see it in in, uh, in cases like the World's End murders. You see it in, in stuff like Bible John. Like even over here where people come forward many years later and say, yeah, like, I fucking told you about this. Mm -hmm. And the investigators today have no idea. So, yeah, yeah I don't know if it's, a, you, know, you don't know if it's a record keeping issue or what, but it does seem to be a, a common theme in a lot of these investigations. Someone coming forward going, yeah, I told you guys about this ages ago and you didn't do anything about it or you don't even know about it. Yeah, it does seem a little strange to me, but like you say, if it's something that, that occurs quite regularly in cases i'm sure things do get misplaced people take down notes especially as we've some have alluded to that maybe the tra the police weren't as trained in this sort of thing but that seems like a pretty pivotal th you know that's the last time they were seen yeah it's a case that eventually became so high profile in the right. community and yet the investigation lost or didn't record the man's testimony this has caused some who still follow the case to suggest and again this is pure speculation at this time that there was a local cover-up about the girl's disappearance from 1969 onward and that someone within the police department was if not covering up evidence for someone else actually involved somehow themselves it's important here to remind ourselves that this is a wild rumor and that it must be terrible for investigating officers to have suspicion cast their way if, if they're innocent and trying to do the right thing but in cases like this with such a close-knit community it's not impossible that more than one person within that community knows what happened and exerted influence to have it brushed under the carpet look it's another parallel to the bible john case you know hints yeah. of a cover-up same era same year i think 69 wow. did you say yeah you know corruption was i don't want to say it was more widespread but it was more blatant in that time than it is today yeah policing was a lot more informal let's put it that way and people know people and they go look it's not it's not my boy my boy didn't have anything to do with it yeah i know your boy didn't have anything to do with it and i'll make sure that yeah his name doesn't appear and then you know that kind those kind of agreements were probably easier to make and therefore more common there is the other possibility that the witness is wrong 
or is lying or simply misremembers giving yeah. a statement or as some have also suggested that local law enforcement at the time was understaffed and as we've mentioned already inexperienced and that some interviews were misplaced all those avenues could be considered the new witness who came forward said that he picked the girls up along from the school and then dropped them at a gas station further along river road police chief mark david recently suggested in the press that it's possible the girls did make it to downtown Oscoda, though those details have stayed tightly inside the police records. We don't know then if there have been other witnesses now that for some investigative reason we've not been made privy to. The official public stance is still that Patricia and Pamela were last seen on River Road, possibly left at a gas station that led further into town or could be used to eventually join uh, an interstate. I've looked at local meteorological information for the area on the 31st of October 1969 and nearby I'll... That's my boy. <laughs> that's a Yates move if I've ever heard it. <laughs> yeah. I'm always checking yeah, well... the weather. That's, that's a resource. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. People make claims about things that they happened at a certain uh, time. The meteorological data is available. Nobody ever checks it. And you can check what the weather was when people say things. Yeah. You can look back and you can check if they were lying or not. Swear to God. Yeah. Michael said it snowed and he couldn't make it into town to come for a pint. He was lying. <laughs> <laughs> he was lying to his team. <laughs> Sending me images of where I live. <laughs> it's as dry as a bone, Michael. Dry as a bone. So I've looked at the meteorological information for that area uh, in nearby Alpena or Alpena. The temperature between 2 and 3 p.m. that day was... 15 to 16 degrees Fahrenheit or around 7 degrees Celsius. As you walk along River Road towards Oscoda, you are heading alongside the Osable River with winds off of Lake Huron ahead blowing towards you. It's good Glasgow temperature, that. <laughs> While the Alpena report suggests that there were no high winds that day, other sources have mentioned that even a breeze from the lake on a day like that would feel colder than yeah. the recorded temperature. Pamela was wearing a long white imitation fur coat that day, but was not wearing thick clothes underneath it. It was reported that she was wearing a skirt with white knee-high socks. Patricia was wearing a plaid jacket and matching skirt. Some have suggested that the girls wouldn't have walked the distance of River Road that day, because they would have felt too cold, but I don't know. When you're younger, you often don't feel the cold the same way, and a, and a plaid jacket and a fake fur jacket could certainly keep you warm. What's more suspicious about the events that day is the fact that by the time the bomb threat or fire alarm had been cleared, the girls wouldn't have had much longer to go at school that day. So you might think that would make skipping the last part of the day easier but a school bus ran from the high school to a Skoda town and it would have been along shortly so why didn't they just wait hmm. and take the bus what age did you say they were you were what 16 17 16 and 15 okay you know maybe it's not so much the fact of being able to escape but maybe it's more of the idea of escaping school just has a romance to it you know what i'm saying like maybe it's not yeah. like logistic maybe it's not like a logistical issue but maybe it's more like hey let's go you know let's yeah. let's just cut school yeah as you say the buzz the fun of it i'm just thinking at that age maybe you don't have the best planning skills but you have that kind of you know passion and excitement i remember i mean at that age i remember people being like do you want to, do you want to just go to the park across the road from the school like rather than or going the pub back for classes or stuff like that you know so so it could yeah you're absolutely right it could just be that that they've just sort of it's been a last minute thing like oh let's let's do it and it's just a, a bit of a buzz for them but it also could be the fact that they left and didn't wait for the bus or anything like that that could also hint at the possibility of a pre-arranged meetup that yeah. had some urgency to it it's been reported in the press and by the families numerous times the fact that patricia and pamela would go somewhere together was unusual while they would have known each other they were not considered to be friends right and they weren't also considered to associate with each other in school at all that's interesting and it like it is interesting to me but then i'm also thinking i i should have checked this i don't know what the the size of the, the high school could have been but like if oscoda only had like 900 people in it then maybe the actual school itself wouldn't have been that big so you would think maybe they would they would really know each other but, yeah. but the, the families have specifically said in the press and friends have specifically said these two girls 
what's really strange about this is they didn't associate with each other. Yeah, that like they specifically said that. Yeah, because it, because it really it struck both families and some of the the friends people in the town as as that was one of the they weren't maybe in the same friends friend group kind of thing I guess. Yeah, but then obviously they must have moved in some of the same circles because they were going to go to that Halloween party. Maybe wouldn't have showed up together, you know, like maybe weren't. Yeah, you know, in the same orbit maybe, but not in the same cluster of friends but you know it does strike me as strange because you know imagine imagine for example you know i'm in okay let's let's put this into the scottish context i'm in sixth year you're in fourth year Always. and i say to you or maybe it should be the other way around because you are older but i um, are you okay for that? <laughs> and i say to you oh that's bloody fire alarm come on let's go and get wrecked let's go to the pub let's go and get wrecked right even if i wasn't in your immediate friends group you're like ah let's go opportunistic Let's just go, right? We we happen to find ourselves together. There's an the opportunity to leave school, even though we are not the best of friends. We find ourselves in the yeah. same place at the same time. An opportunity to go and get up to some mischief. Maybe you would still take it. Like if you weren't actively enemies, maybe you would still take it. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly times I remember at, at high school where there were some people who you kind of temporarily hung around with. Yeah. Just for and and sometimes that did end up being like it's just situational. Like, like I remember one, what I remember one day where I ended up hanging about with like a group that I just never it never happened before and it never happened after. You know, so like yeah, it, that absolutely could could have happened. That being said, remember that they were supposed to be going to a Halloween party that evening, albeit not together. It's possible they left the school early together to go and some have suggested to get their costumes ready or as others have suggested even to make sure they got access to like the best treats before anyone else on the porches of homes around town. I mean I would have thought sometimes you think maybe 15 and 16 is a bit, a bit older to go out trick or treating but it's not really in America I don't think and even here there's people that still dress up and go out sometimes at like 15 so it's possible like you say it could have been an opportunistic thing they could have been outside the school when the fire alarm went off and just started talking and being like oh i want to get back and this place has always got great candy or sweets or whatever and like just like why well, just go you know yeah. and so it could have been something like that reese's cups are reese's cups mate doesn't matter who you are well, mate mate uh the the bright lights of chocolate and peanut butter <laughs> cannot be <laughs> underestimated <laughs> But maybe it wasn't about Halloween at all. What if they were going to meet someone wearing a uniform instead of a costume? At the time, Wurtsmith Air Force Base was just outside of Oskoda. Its personnel far outnumbered the population of Oskoda itself. Remember that Oskoda had a population of under 1,000 at its height, and I believe at that time... The base had more than 3,000 personnel that and 700 things. civilians. I also mentioned this because there were rumours that one of the girls had been picked up by local law enforcement after an incident in the woods surrounding the Air Force base. It was alleged that this incident involved one of the girls being inebriated, either with drugs or alcohol, with the possible involvement of someone on the base. This all supposedly happened weeks before the disappearance. If the details sound vague, that's because I don't have a lot to go on about this accusation Aye. other than a few posts online mention it and others alluding to it. I mean, the presence of that base completely changes the whole lie of the land because yeah. if you've got somewhere that has thousands of young men next to a town of a few hundred people you know like they're transient as well so they're coming and going from all different parts of the country that you know that completely changes everything like you say it opens up the possibilities there's no concrete evidence that this event took place and it's possible that it became ingrained in the folklore surrounding the case moving from local rumors to online speculation as time went on nonetheless it's important to consider the possibility that this rumour is true. Pamela's family has since said that she was somewhat rebellious, though not to the degree where they thought she would try to run away. One of the family members was quoted as saying that she was involved in things that her mother would not approve of, but of course we can say that on most teenagers. Imagine then if the girls were 
going to meet someone connected to the Air Force base to score drugs, alcohol, it's possible. But there is another darker rumour that has persisted for some time and I believe has been with us since the disappearance that one of the girls was pregnant and that the father was either personnel or worked on the Air Force base. Let's say Pamela and Patricia went to meet this man somewhere locally. Whichever one was pregnant, the rumours don't always make this clear, asked the other to accompany her. Maybe she was scared. Maybe in her bones she knew something was wrong and thought she would be safe with someone else along for the ride. Perhaps this is why, as strange as it seems, the two girls were together. If you were scared that the truth might come out, you might ask someone to be with you who isn't quite in your inner circle, simply because you wouldn't have to deal with the guilt or perceived shame or, per or fear that people that you do know are going to find out. Or just you want to go and meet the guy, but at the same time, you do have some inkling that something's wrong. There's something, there's some sense of threat and you just want someone, anyone to come with you because you think, well, if someone comes with me, that's a guarantee that nothing bad is going to happen but unfortunately isn't. So let's say Patricia and Pamela go to meet the father. The father or someone associated with him picks the girls up expecting only one of them to be there. This makes things more difficult. After all it's easier to overpower and dispose of one person on their own. Christ. With two this complicates things. One of them could get away and alert the police but the secret has to be covered up. The baby and its mother must disappear, and any witness to the murder is collateral damage. Surrounding the Air Force base is plenty of woodland. Some of the personnel who enjoyed outdoor pursuits would sometimes go hunting there. If the rumours are true, it was in those same very woods where one of the girls was partying weeks before. The killer could have known the woods intimately found a place where he wouldn't be bothered, he would have been armed and hell-bent on disposing of an unwanted pregnancy. He takes the girls out there under benign pretenses, offering alcohol, drugs, or perhaps a doctor, meeting them under the cloak of the forest for an illegal abortion, I don't know, and then the killer executes both of the girls. The bodies could have been disposed of in the woods, or, as has also been suggested, in Lake Huron itself. I mean, that's thousands of square kilometres, right? Yeah. This wasn't the only theory that swirled around about what happened to Patricia and Pamela. In 2010, it was reported in the local press that the police had learned of a local rumour concerning the fate of the two young women. It seems that this rumour was common knowledge, a piece of local folklore about what had happened that, eventually, law enforcement took seriously. In 1985, Police caught wind of whispers about two local men having murdered the girls. It was said that the bodies had then been buried under or near a barn owned by local Jack Searle. Bizarrely, this tip-off was never followed up at the time, to my knowledge at least. It wasn't until decades later when new police chief Mark David looked back into the case and was shocked to find that nothing had been done about the rumour. Even he had heard the story, having been a teenager himself back in the 80s. He assumed that it had been investigated, but it hadn't. Who was involved in the original investigation? Was it just the local police force or was the FBI involved? I know the FBI commented on the case, but I don't know if they were actively in the area, if you know what I mean. I don't know if yeah. I don't know how active they would have been. Because it's the sort of case where the crime itself may not have, you know, crossed state lines. So the FBI might not not that I know all of the situations in which the FBI could become involved, but my understanding is usually the FBI become involved when a potential crime crosses state lines, it becomes a federal crime. And if it stays within a local area, you're just dealing with local sort of cops. Not to, you know, not to put them down or anything, but as you say, you know, cops who are not necessarily experienced in complex investigations of this sort. Yeah. I think also the fact that it wasn't initially followed up and that the later police chief was shocked about that has led others to continue that line we talked about earlier. Yeah. About that some of this was brushed under the carpet. I even saw 
reports online of people saying that every year or so pictures of the girls uh, are put up in the town and some of them are put up uh, where, where they've been aged mm. so that you would see what they look like now and I think quite astonishingly apparently they've been getting torn down inside the town That's a bit the, weird. the pictures of the girls which, which is strange but that could just be that people are fed up of it it could be who knows there's a lot of strange sort of mo- motivations around nowadays not to get into kind of all the, the sort of political different political things but there's a lot of different motivations sort of for and against protecting women yeah you know it could also be that people just they, in a small community like that they want to move on from it maybe and that every few years that it, it raises its head or looking at the true dark side of it it's possible that it is someone who knows something yeah that's been doing that it's a pretty stupid move if you've got away with it yeah for, of course you know 40 50 years just go out and start tearing down posters but could be yeah the horrible thing as well is that sometimes people just do things like that out of badness yeah and it's nothing to do they've got no connection to it they just tear stuff down i suppose it depends as well on who's reporting that it's torn down and when because those posters could have been up for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and someone could have just torn them down because it's been sitting there for ages and no one's responded to it and yeah. someone who's sitting waiting for a response is like why is someone torn this down you know there's a spot where on my way home from work as it was before i moved house unfortunately as i pass through a particular underpass there's all these posters up for one guy who's disappeared and um mm. For the whole time I've been traveling that route, four or five years until I moved house, every time I went through there, there's these posters about a guy who disappeared in like 2016, 2017. And clearly nothing's ever come of it. But these posters have been up for a long, long time. Someone keeps replacing them. Clearly a member of the family or something. And over that scale of time, someone's pulling some of them down. Maybe someone's defaced one or two. Some of them have just been damaged by time. And someone keeps coming back, keeps replacing them. But imagining yeah. you were that person who was putting the posters out. You were the person who is upset. You know, your your family members disappeared. You, whether they're dead or not, you want to know what happened. You, the only thing you know how to do is to keep putting these posters out. And someone tears one down, someone damages one, someone defaces one. Just by sheer odds of them being out in the open, in the public domain, that happens. Whether it's motivated by anything or not, you might react by going, "Someone has attacked these posters. Therefore, that must be a sign." How long have they been out there? It might be a sign of something. It might not. Yeah, absolutely. So there's no way to know. But I did find it interesting that that had been mentioned by a couple of people that had been happening. So back to that rumor about the girls being murdered by two local men and the bodies of the girls being buried under a barn owned by a man named Jack Searle. In response to becoming police chief and finding out that that rumour had never been investigated, Mark David brought in cadaver dogs, trained to respond and seek out human remains. The dogs showed no indication that there were any bodies in the vicinity. Mm. The owner of the barn, Jack Searle, had already passed away by this time, so we have no idea if he was involved in anything or not. Even if the barn had been the resting place of the girls, someone else could have put the bodies there without the owner's knowledge. What is interesting, however, is that the Searle barn was known as a place where teenagers could hang out and do drugs and alcohol. Given that even Pamela's sister herself said that she was a quote-unquote partier and was sometimes involved in things that her family didn't approve of, you wonder if Pamela and perhaps Patricia had ever been to that barn. You also wonder if, if that is somewhere that teenagers go to hang out and party, if that's where the rumour started, teenagers trying to scare each other, oh yeah, they're buried under that barn, we go and drink it. I, I didn't even think about that, but that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. That's a really good point because that's the sort of thing that happens all the time. People build up the, certainly I did that. You build up the the mythology of the places that you're that you inhabit. You're in. Yeah. So was that barn where the girls had gone, never to return? So far, no evidence of that has been found. So it could all be tall tales. However, it has been known for cadaver dogs to miss human remains when they have been decomposing for many years, and this was several decades later. 
I saw one photograph of the investigation at the barn and it does appear that some digging was carried out as well mm. but I'm not sure how extensive this was given the nature of the cold case and the negative signs from the cadaver dogs. It has struck me thinking about that barn that if the rumours were so pronounced about the bodies being there, so widespread, could the killers have exhumed them and moved the bodies elsewhere, worried that at some point the police would go there and look around? It's been suggested that at some point, either in the local woods or at the barn, a necklace carrying a peace symbol was found. Patricia Spencer was wearing a similar necklace before she disappeared. However, Given the peace movement of the 60s, this was a common symbol that many would have worn. In any case, the discovery of the peace necklace hasn't been verified. As far as I can tell, it's another one of these rumours that's been circulated. In a bizarre twist, in 2003, some believed that the remains of the girls had been found. While looking for another missing woman, more on that in a moment, a cadaver dog and its handler discovered human bones in a woodland area. But while the handler was standing around the area, one witness thought they saw her plant something on the ground, before then getting her dog over to the same spot and finding a bone fragment. Eventually the dog handler was taken to court for allegedly planting evidence, and it's been claimed that several cases were contaminated by the handler doing the same at other crime scenes. Where she got the human bones from, I don't know, but it's likely to have been from her access to forensic test scenes where human corpses are used to train the cadaver dogs. So what, she was just like giving the dogs something very obvious to find so that, it, why? So that it looked like the dogs were really good at finding body parts, but they were shit at it? No, no, no. From what I could see in the press was that the, the accusation against the dog handler was that, that she had this amazing reputation for like always finding some sort of human remains. Right, right. And that she had basically been planting some of that stuff to like keep that reputation going. So yeah, so like she was trying to make herself and the dogs look better than they really were. Yeah, and like she messed up and someone saw her doing it. And so then other, other cases that she'd worked on were brought into question. The funny thing is, I don't know if she was actually a police employee the way it was worded in some of the press made me think that she was like a kind of contractor. That yeah, I think a lot of these people are. It must have been terrible for the victim's families thinking that maybe the truth was about to be revealed to discover that it had been fabricated. It's tragic to hear about the families still searching for answers all of these years later and yet no answer has come. We can only hope that one does eventually to give them peace. That's where I would have left the disappearance of Pamela and Patricia, but sometimes when we're researching these cases, Martin, you stumble upon something that catches your eye. Oh, why? And this has happened with this case, and I find it equal parts fascinating and equal parts unnerving. This is the bit where I sit up in my chair, Michael. Yeah. This is the bit. My God, you son of a bitch. You <laughs> son of a bitch. What I'm about to discuss is only a theory, and I'm sure others must have considered it. It's stuck with me for weeks, and so I think it's one we should share just in case it's on the right track. Let me ask you a question. What if Patricia and Pamela's disappearances were not isolated incidents? What if they were only the tip of the iceberg? I mentioned before that Oscoda is a very small town. I don't know what the statistics would be for a population of 900 or so, but you would think that murder and the disappearances would really happen in such a small population. You'd think that. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that. But I also would have been wrong. And I also want to say at this point, I'm not being disparaging about the area at all. I think it's just important to look at some unusual things that have happened around there. December 23rd, 1976. Just seven years after Pamela and Patricia vanished, without a trace. 20 year old Harold Hiram Covey left what I believe is a local area or camping ground called Karen's Cabins in Oscoda and got into a dark blue Chevy truck with someone. He was never heard from or seen again. When law enforcement investigated his disappearance, they found that he had left all of his belongings behind. It's likely that he met an untimely end. Due to the similarities in his appearance, a John Doe found across the country in Mount Baldy. I'm saying Baldy. I'm saying Baldy. <laughs> it might be Baldy. 
Ja, dem var det. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mount Slaphead. In Los Angeles County in March of 1979, this John Doe has been proposed to be the very same Harold Hiram Covey. So wait, has it been confirmed or just someone thinks? No, it's been proposed to be the very same, but this has never been verified. The body of the John Doe was discovered 425 feet down a ravine. But wait, do they not have like DNA and shit that can check this? I don't know the ins and outs of it. You would, yeah, you would think that, but there are so many missing people. Yeah, that, aye, that's true. Some of these things go decades before, or they might not even have DNA for the original victim. This yeah, is going back to 1976. True. Yeah, unless you have a lock of their hair or something. Yeah. Yeah, or maybe family members. Sometimes I think they can do something, but it just depends. Like the body of the John Doe was discovered 425 feet down a ravine. The victim had been decapitated. Later, the remains of his skull were found, and forensic artists were able to kind of reconstruct the face which is eerily similar to a photograph of Harold. Less than 10 miles away from that horror, another unknown victim was found, likewise decapitated. So far, the person who likely murdered both people remains unknown. On the National Missing Unidentified Persons site, also known as NamUs, which works to resolve discovered yet unidentified remains, case number 57344, describes a partial jawbone from a woman located on Lake Huron Beach in Oscoda, 20 feet west of the water's edge and 30 feet south of the boardwalk leading to the beach. The bone was discovered on July 28, 2017 and was tangled up in a mess of dry weeds and small sticks. God. The condition of the remains is classified as not recognisable but certainly human. The age and date of death is so far unknown. Yeah. Whether the remains of Pamela or Patricia or some other unfortunate person to vanish in the surrounding areas over the decades, the bone fragment remains another strange discovery of death in and around Oscoda, Michigan. You know, whether that's whether that's them or not. It's someone. It's someone. Person yeah. who had a life and parents and people who loved them. And whether that's one of those girls or not, it's still a tragedy, isn't it? Absolutely. I mentioned earlier, the family's constantly responding to alleged finds yeah. and things being discovered in the area and every time thinking... Yeah, and, and whether it's this family or another family someone out there is missing someone that that jaws the key to it isn't it yeah sadly there are other accounts of disappearances almost 11 years after pamela and patricia disappeared during august of 1980 21 year old chirita thomas was driving across a skoda to pick up her child from a babysitter chirita never made it there and her child would tragically never be reunited with its mother right. what's clear is that chirita's car broke down on the way. Three young men stopped to help her and wrapped a radiator up to stop steam escaping from it so she could continue on her way for a while. She then drove off. Another witness said that she broke down again and was then picked up by a man driving a blue pickup truck. That was the last anyone ever saw of Churita. The ins and outs of that case could be an episode in of itself. But a man named Jimmy Nelson was eventually arrested decades later. He was then charged and tried for Chita's murder, though her body was never found. Did Jimmy Nelson have anything to do with the Air Force Base? I'm not sure actually, but the main evidence against Jimmy Nelson was that he was a known violent racist and Chita was one of few black women living in the area at the time. Jimmy also drove a dark blue pickup truck. As it stands right now, Jimmy Nelson was convicted and went to jail before being exonerated. A sealed grand jury file allegedly claims that the reason he was eventually released was because law enforcement had good reason to believe someone else had killed Chirita, though they lacked the evidence to prove that beyond reasonable doubt in a court. Could that person also have murdered Pamela and Patricia? I did find it eerie that both Harold Covey and Charita Thomas were last seen getting into a blue truck. And I can't help but think that they might have been driven by the same person, mm. especially considering that the disappearances occurred only four years apart. 
in looking at this case, I've come across a lot of disappearances in and around Oscoda, but you start to go further out and the links become more tenuous. I do want to thank the great users over at WebSleuth that we mentioned earlier on for some of their posts about this because it has been extremely helpful. It's possible that some of those disappearances just outside of Oscoda could be related, such as um, the disappearance of Lester Eugene Barr. This is a bit later on though, in 1994, from Turner, Michigan, about a 40 minute drive from Oscoda. He left his belongings and his social security checks behind, his only source of income. As I say, it's possible that disappearances like that around the area could be connected, but that becomes increasingly difficult to prove, and the wider you cast the net, inevitably, mm. the more disappearances you are going to find. Aye. Sadly, people vanishing happens more than you think, and sometimes it's a case of people going off to commit suicide or to just escape their current situation and move off to somewhere else without telling anyone. It's also, sadly, the case that many homeless people start off this way, leaving their places of origin behind due to mental health issues and are sometimes found decades later sleeping rough in another part of the country. But not usually together and yeah. without witness you know maybe two disappear together and yeah. one reappears and says the other one this the other one's gone off on the rails somewhere but the fact two of them disappeared and were never heard from again from two different yeah. families makes me think that unfortunately makes yeah. me think that probably they're not in a position to ever be found again yeah so while we need to rein things in a bit when looking at the disappearance of pamela and patricia to keep things focused and to avoid muddying the waters there are some disappearances and murders in and around Michigan State that have stronger connections. In my mind at least to this case, and this has also been suggested by people in the press and things like that as well. So stepping away from a Skoda for a moment to another location in Michigan, Ann Harbor. 13 year old Cynthia Kuhn vanished and was never found in January of 1970, just three months on from the two schoolgirls in Oscoda. Her disappearance has some eerie similarities to that of Patricia and Pamela. Cynthia looked not too dissimilar to them. She was also only two years younger than Pamela, and most tellingly of all, she disappeared while on a road which led from her school. Mm -hmm. It's possible that the same killer moved on to another area in the state and used the same tactics just a few months on, picking up a young girl on the road along from her school. Of course, unfortunately, it's also possible that this is a copycat case, or simply that child killers and abductors by very definition target places where children can be found. The difference in this case, however, from what happened to Pamela and Patricia is that Cynthia made two calls to her family after she vanished. Cynthia was unsure of where she was, but subsequent phone calls were then made from a man wanting money in return for Cynthia's safety. But sadly, the calls dried up after that and Cynthia was gone. Mm. Due to the similarities between both cases and that they took place in the same state, albeit quite a distance apart, some have connected these unsolved crimes. If true, this would suggest that what we are looking at here is not the product of a meetup gone bad, but rather the terrible handiwork of a serial killer. The ransom angle, however, doesn't quite fit, though we have no idea whether that was simply someone trying to extort money from the family, using the disappearance of their child to their advantage. Bearing in mind the Air Force Base, right? You look at that and you think, well, it needn't necessarily be a case that's geographically anchored in that place because you have this huge contingent of young men who are not anchored necessarily in that specific place but who, you know, travel around among different bases around the world, in fact. That, to me, feels like a huge, a huge possible source of... I mean, we discussed it already, but it seems to me that the, the Air Force Base is the glaring elephant in the, in the room in this case. Yeah, I... I absolutely agree i mean i'm not i'm not saying anything specifically about the u.s air force base we could be talking about the yeah you know the british air force here but anytime you yeah. have a concentration of thousands of young men there's going to be a tiny number of those men but a concentration of them who have issues right yep and funnily enough we're going to get to that in a little minute the cynthia kuhn disappearance remains unsolved but in following the case you go down a rabbit hole as some have connected it, not just to Pamela and Patricia, but to several horrific events that were happening in and around Michigan at that time. If those connections are true, then we are dealing potentially with many disappearances 
and deaths that remain unsolved. Between February 15th 1976 and March 16th 1977, Michigan was in the grips of a killing spree perpetuated by a man labelled as the Oakland County Child Killer. I should warn at this point, it's about to get pretty grim. Because it's been all fucking rainbows until this point. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I... Uh, <laughs> the victims were Mark Douglas Stebbins, 12 years of age, Jill Robinson, also 12, Christine Marie Mihalik, 10, and Timothy John King, 11. All four children were discovered murdered in various locations, with strangulation, suffocation, and even a gunshot to the face in one instance, being the killer's horrific methods of murdering his victims. The killer was never caught, though there was an artist's impression of what he looked like. There remain several other victims that detectives seriously consider as possibly dying at the hands of the same man. Donna Serra, 17 years old, killed while hitchhiking. She was leaving her school that day mm. to travel to a beach. The parallels here are clear with what potentially happened to Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley. Jane Louise Allen, 13, was also found dead at another scene, as was Kimberly Alice King at just 12 years old. I can't help but notice that Kimberly and John King share the same last name. Or was that the killer trying to relive the experience of his previous kill, or it may just have been a coincidence? Two other potential victims were Valerie Bishop, 10 years old, and Laura Wilson, 16. Many of these victims were picked up and taken somewhere by the Oakland County child killer from the side of a road. The descriptions are just horrendous and I can't even fathom the anguish that the families must have gone through. But you may have anticipated that Patricia and Pamela both have been considered as potential victims of the murderer's killing spree. One of the reasons for this revolves around the potential identity of the Oakland County child killer. You see, the first known victim, Mark Douglas Stebbins, disappeared after attending an American Legion Hall. The American Legion is a non-profit organisation for veterans, but they do put on programmes for children and teenagers. One theory was that the Oakland County child killer was either at that American Legion Hall or he was waiting outside of it to grab one of the younger people there. Where is Oakland County relative to... Oh, it's like, uh, I think it's a, like a couple of hours away. So it is like, it's not... It's not on the doorstep, but it's close enough, right? Yeah, it's within driving distance. If you cast your mind back to the man who came forward recently to say that he had dropped Patricia and Pamela off at a gas station, that gas or petrol station is near an American Legion Hall. Mm. In fact, I think it's across the road from it. I know it's a tenuous link, but mm. it's one that has been mentioned as one of several possible connections between the different disappearances and murders. While I would never in any way besmirch the reputations of veterans dealing with the post-traumatic stress of war, could the killer have been a veteran at that American Legion Hall? Crimeandinvestigation.co.uk has an article about the sheer number of Vietnam veterans who served around this time, some with distinction, and who then went on to be serial killers. Arthur Shawcross, the Genesee River Killer, Joseph James Nagelo, who was the Golden State Killer, Gary Ridgway, who was the Green River Killer, William Bonin, who was the Freeway Killer, Randy Kraft, who was the Scorecard Killer, Leonard Lake, Gary Christ, Lewington, yeah. Ronald Gene Simmons, Joseph Ernest Atkins, Kenneth Lee Boyd, Gary Bradford Cohn, James Floyd Davis, Philip Carl Jablonski, Some James Rodney Johnson, here, James, James Allen Kinney, Leonard Marvin Laws, Daryl Mees, Michael Andrew Nicalo, Gary Lee Roll, Morris Solomon Jr., Russell Wayne Wagner, Ward Weaver Jr., Dan White, Marvin Beagler, David Livingston Funches. <laughs> Funches. It's not funny, That's but fucking hell, Michael. No, it's not funny, <laughs> Funches. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry, we're going to hell. We're both going to hell. Yeah, that is a ridiculous name, Funches. I wonder if I've if I've written that wrong. Um, I I stay in. No, in. Funches. I think it's Funches. I fun. I know, no, but I've, the way it's spelled, it's Funches. <laughs> <laughs> William Mentzer, Larry Wayne White, John Dwight Kennedy, David Notek, Jeffrey Don Lundgren, and Roy Lewis Norris. All of these men served in the Vietnam War, <laughs> returned, and then killed. 
multiple times. Is that funny? You know? it's just the, the sheer number of names that you just read out is quite staggering. Yeah, it's horrifying, isn't it? I'm not making this light of the situation, but you did read a hell of a lot of names there. And they weren't. I know, I know I'm sorry. They weren't good names. But no, this, this doesn't take into account the number of soldiers who came back, killed once, and then were caught. So they didn't get the opportunity to do it again. It's it's not that people who serve in the, the military are, we're not saying that they're more likely to be involved in these things. But when you concentrate thousands of young men in a certain area, in, you know, in an area that may be quite rural, not have a large number of indigenous population, a certain number of those people are going to have issues, you know, violence yeah. issues. It's not necessarily an issue of, oh, you know, this person is a veteran and this person isn't. But then when yeah. you're dealing with people who are, you know, all in the military, all in the Air Force, all in the Navy, all in whatever, they're going to be predominantly young men. They're all going to be condensed in a single small area. Things are going to happen. Yeah. You know, whether it's the military or whether it's something else, it just happens to be that the military is one of the few things that condenses that number of young men in that type of an area. Right. Definitely. This is a particularly difficult topic as obviously the vast majority of veterans would never ever do such a thing and I can't imagine what they went through in Vietnam. However, I also think that the brutality of war where young people are trained both in mind and body to kill others and who are exposed to the most horrific events around them would perhaps twist a small number of the population, unlocking a dormant desire to kill and perhaps even producing serial killers who otherwise would have kept their violent tendencies more in check. Of course, there's also the possibility that those with killer tendencies were simply more likely to flourish during war, perhaps even volunteering before being conscripted. Plus, also, people who move around are more likely to find themselves in a situation where they can get away with things. Uh, yeah. You know, you look at someone like Robert Black, who was a Scottish serial killer of children, as grim as that is. He had a job. It was nothing to do with the military. He had a job selling... I think it was he was selling posters to like record shops mm -hmm. but he he drove as a result of that job he drove all over the uk selling posters to record shops nothing to do with the the military but then of course also the military people travel all over the country all over the world as a result of yeah. that job and on top of that they also are expected to kill people so yeah you know it's not necessarily an issue with the military it's an issue with rootless young usually young guys traveling without a, a, a sort of a location to which they're attached to yeah during the vietnam war the phoenix program was in operation this was a military strategy to essentially find kill and deter any civilian people from assisting the Viet Cong. this involved torture sessions rape assassinations bombings kidnaps and even burning entire villages to the ground. While this was mostly carried out by South Vietnamese forces, US soldiers were claimed to be involved too. The trauma of being involved in such a program and to potentially oversee or even carry out the horrendous Phoenix program strategy would have scarred many involved. Arthur Shawcross was a serial killer who murdered 11 people in New York and claimed to have been involved in the Phoenix program. Miguel Mike Valle or Valles, also often referred to as Miguel or Mike Ramirez, killed, raped and decapitated people during the Vietnam War as a Green Beret. If the name sounds familiar, that's because he was the older cousin of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker killer. Yeah, I could have sworn there was a, there was someone, there was a serial killer whose uncle showed them Polaroids of themselves decapitating bodies or something in Vietnam. And themselves may have been a serial killer. Is that who we're talking about? Was it Richard Ramirez's uncle? Yeah. Miguel boasted to Richard about the despicable things he did during the Vietnam War and allegedly even showed Polaroid, Polaroid. photographs. Right. That's who of we're some talking of the about. Women he tortured. Yeah. Of some of the women he tortured and killed. One of those photographs was reportedly a picture of Miguel laughing and holding the head of a woman he had raped and decapitated. Fucking bastard. Aye. It's horrendous. Richard Ramirez later spoke of how the stories and photographs shown to him by his cousin Miguel fascinated him and combined with the abuse that Richard suffered at the hands of his own father left an indelible mark on Richard that contributed yeah. to his twisted desires to kill people. Yeah. What we should say here, however, is that as horrific as that is... No, and I'm, I'm, I was going to get to that actually, that people had 
suggested that some of the things he'd said were not true. When Richard was 13, he witnessed Miguel murder his own wife, Josefina, with a handgun, though some speculate that the killing may have gone down in a different way, mm. with Richard either fabricating or lying about some of it, or apparently frightened of Miguel and what he might do to him if he told the truth. So there is the question about whether Richard was involved or not. Miguel spent much of his life in and out of psychiatric hospitals and the army gave him a 100% disability rating when he was discharged. Apparently that rating is rarely given and it suggests he saw and was involved in particularly brutal events. It's been suggested that Miguel may have been the person who showed Richard how to kill. Miguel died of a heart attack aged 45. The point of all this is that based on the things Miguel allegedly did while in Vietnam, working off of a blacklist of civilians and raping and murdering them often in the middle of the night, that he was indeed one of many soldiers involved in the Phoenix program. So that's two serial killers, at least there were possibly members of the Phoenix program, and once they had been involved in such despicable war crimes, could they really have come back to civilian life and not have been utterly changed by that? Again, I in no way want to disparage veterans. The vast, vast majority are people who are committed to protecting their countries and who never ever commit crimes against civilians during combat. I know this has been particularly disturbing as a tangent, but the point I'm making to bring it back to Patricia and Pamela's disappearance is that they were last seen near an American Legion hall, but the first victim of the Oakland County child killer, Mark Douglas Stebbins, had been attending an American Legion Hall and never made it home alive. As you mentioned, Martin, the importance of the airbase and its proximity to Oscoda. Is it possible that a veteran attending those two halls or who were on that base opportunistically murdered Mark Douglas Stebbins and followed Pamela and Patricia when leaving the hall near Oscoda gas station? To summarise then, some believe the Oakland County child killer may have been a veteran and that Patricia and Pamela were two of his potential victims. Of course, there are some huge leaps here and there are differences between the cases, but we can't discount the Oakland County child killer as a suspect due to the proximity, time period and some, albeit tenuous, connections. Well, look, what, what was the population of the town again? But 900. 900. What was the population of the airbase again? 3,000 personnel and 700 civilians. Okay, so within that small area, there was 3,900 people living and 900 of them were locals, 3,000 of them were military personnel. So it seems to me, regardless of any preconceptions we might have about military personnel or not, if you treat them all equally, it's still more likely that whoever did that was military personnel than local, right? Yeah, I've maybe not made that clear enough. The 700 civilians, I think, were on the base as well. So I'm yeah. assuming they were like family members and things like that and people that are contracted on it. So you had the yeah, 3,700 and then the 900 who were in Oscoda, if you know what I mean. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are you eating quavers? Sorry, I'm, I'm sure you can hear me eating quavers. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. I had a quaver in my mouth and I was like, this is a really somber moment. I should I should nod my head silently in the agreement. I was like, but but my heart, my, my soul was like, I need to crunch this quaver. I was like, I need to, can need I quaver. crunch this quaver without Michael hearing it? And I crunched it and I could see it on the waveform. I was like, ah, oh, I'm fucking busted. Beautiful. It's a beautiful moment. It's a beautiful moment in talking to Don history. Talk until dawn. Call that again Drink where people like dawn. lick the like the mic and all that shit. What do you call that again? When they lick the mic. You know, when you they eat and they fucking use oh, their yeah, fingernails. ASMR. 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 That's, that's it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> A lot of other channels don't have any problems about using the ASMR in relation to horrific murders. Yeah. Maybe we should Maybe Jesus. we should throw all our, our morality to the wind as well, Michael. No, I'm not doing that. I'm holding on to it for <laughs> dear life, sir. Or I will just sink. Unfortunately, the Oakland County child killer is not the only possible suspect that we need to look at when trying to figure out what happened to Patricia and Pamela. Between 1967 and 1969, throughout the southeastern parts of Michigan, John Norman Collins was carrying out a brutal killing spree of his own. At least seven victims were murdered between the ages of 13 and 21. All were abducted before they were raped and then killed. The bodies were often mutilated after this. John Norman Collins came to be known as the co-ed killer, a name also attributed to Californian serial killer 
murderer Ed Kemper and also he was known as the Michigan murderer. His case is a famous one and those of you who know about this crime will be saying, wait a second, yes Collins was killing young women in the area between 1967 and 1969 and Patricia and Pamela disappeared in 1969 but that was on Halloween. Collins had already been in custody by August of that same year, so it couldn't have been him. Okay. And you would be right, but some believe that Collins didn't kill on his own. Some believe he had an accomplice. Could that accomplice have still been actively targeting young women while Collins was behind bars? Joan Elspeth Shell was one of the murdered women, and she was last seen getting into a car with Collins. However, witness stated that there were two other men with him in that car. It's likely though not certain that one of those men was Andrew Manuel. All credit to researcher Gregory A. Fournier and his excellent phonology blog for some of the background on this individual. As always, the links to all sources are in the show notes. Andrew or Andy Manuel had fraudulently rented a house trailer in June of 1969 in Michigan with John Norman Collins. They drove it out to Salinas, California. At the same time, a 17-year-old girl from Oregon named Roxy Ann Phillips was found brutally murdered while visiting the Salinas area where the two men had taken the trailer. Police had information that their prime suspect was a man named John driving a silver car and who had recently brought a trailer house to the area with an unnamed friend. During the investigation into this murder, an abandoned trailer was discovered at the rear of Andy Manuel's grandfather's property had been reported stolen from Michigan. Manuel was eventually wanted for questioning in connection with a burglary from March of 1969 and another charge. He was arrested in November of that year and in a plea deal agreed to testify against Collins in court. Manuel then broke his probation agreement and served time for the burglary and for fraud, presumably surrounding the purchase of the house trailer with a fake cheque. Given that we know Manuel was a close associate of John Norman Collins during his murder spree and that he was in the area when some of the victims were killed, it's easy to speculate that he was, in fact, an accomplice to the crimes. Indeed, some of the investigating officers once retired claimed that they were certain Collins had not acted alone. Manuel was free and possibly in Michigan at the time. There is also the possibility, as mentioned earlier, of Collins having another accomplice on top of that. Could Manuel and another have seen Patricia and Pamela walking along the road and picked them up, murdering them somewhere nearby and disposing of the remains? I know there are a lot of ifs, buts and maybes and it should be noted that Manuel claimed he had spent very little time with Collins and was shocked to hear about the murders. As well as some connections to these different cases, there are also some other possible suspects. For example, Arthur Ream who was convicted for the murder of 13 year old Cindy Zarzyski in 1986 in Michigan. He's long played mind games with the police. In fact, he wasn't convicted until 2008. In an interview, former Deputy Chief John Calabrese was quoted as saying that he believed Arthur Ream was guilty of other kidnappings and murders. Ream would have been 20 years old at the time of Pamela and Patricia's disappearance. However, while he did kill in the same state, that was over three hours away from a Skoda. What age was he when he killed? When he when he is known to have killed, sorry. Now, I can be corrected on this, but I believe he's only been convicted on a single murder. Talking 16, 17 years after this. Yeah, he'd have been in his 30s, but there seems to be, apparently he has, he wrote a book about himself and all this and he's apparently, he's played a lot of mind games and there are people who genuinely, who were involved in investigating this case that several of them have said like they're, they're pretty sure that he's, he's committed other kidnappings yeah. and then murders. Due to the belief that the one victim attributed to him is only the tip of the iceberg, I've seen his name crop up a few times in relation to Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley. In reality, you could make a case for most serial killers operating in Michigan at that time. I even wondered about Donald Jean Miller who would have been around the same age as Pamela and Patricia in 1969 and in 1977 to 1978 he attacked six people killing four. The clothes of Martha Sue Young, a young woman who had broken off an engagement with him, were found by a lake surrounded by woodland. So he would be what, 16, 17? Yeah, so he'd have been so very young and Donald Jean Miller lived nearly three hours from a Skoda so again, it's, it's probably unlikely. It's quite an audacious crime to commit to murder yeah. two girls together. I mean, I'm no criminologist but to me, 
it seems like the sort of it seems like the sort of crime that was someone who had been active for a long time and was very for want of a better word, experienced in killing would commit rather than someone like yeah. their first or second crime, like to kill two people together. I agree. Un unless it was something that, that happened kind of off the cuff. And yeah. I do think because of because it was a similar age as well, the only reason that sparked in my mind when I was looking at different serial killers who were in Michigan at the time is the fact that being a similar age to them, could these teenage girls have been going to meet this boy? Or, you know, that... But the distance, yeah, it's probably very unlikely. So what are we to make of the tragic disappearance of Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley during Halloween of 1969? Were they targeted by one of several serial killers operating in Michigan at that time? Or was there indeed a, a meet-up with someone from the nearby Air Force base? A man, as some rumours suggest, who might have murdered the girls out in the woods to cover up an unwanted pregnancy? Or what about the runaway theory? Had they left for Flint to chase some unknown musician as infatuated teenagers might have wanted to do? And what about the old barn where town gossip spread claiming two local men had buried the girls? Did the girls meet a tragic end there? Or only to be moved before police responded to the rumours? In my heart of hearts, I hope that the runaway theory is true and that for some undisclosed reason the girls ran off to start a new life somewhere without telling their families that they're alive and well with new identities, perhaps with families of their own, kids, grandkids, alone or not, a life full of happy memories and hopefully a life worth living. But while I hope for that, it seems more likely that on that long cold stretch of river road between their school and Oscoda town, Patricia and Pamela were picked up by someone. Perhaps it was someone they knew, perhaps it wasn't. Either way, someone knows the truth and both girls' families deserve to know what happened to them so that they can find some sort of peace of mind if such peace of mind is even possible. If you've been listening to this podcast and you believe you may have information about this case, go to the show notes below and follow the information to contact the relevant authorities. It's never too late to come forward. Even the smallest of details could help uncover what happened to Pamela and Patricia and put this grisly mystery to rest once and for all. So Martin... What are your thoughts? To me, the thing that stands out most is the presence of that Air Force base. If you separate yeah. that from the demonization of people who were involved in the Vietnam War and you separate it from the kind of canonization of veterans, that's 3,000 young men. Near enough. Maybe, maybe yeah. some of them are women, but the vast majority are young men. And if you take 3,000 young men and you break it down, there's going to be a proportion of those 3,000 young men who have serious issues. You compare it to 900 people in the town, you know, 50% of whom are women, 50% of whom are men. It seems most likely to me that someone on that base knows what happened to those women. Especially when you consider that the population of that base is going to be a continually churning, continually refreshing population. It's not going to be a fixed number of people. It's not going to be fixed individuals, it's going to be people circulating in and out of that base from all over the country, from all over the world. To me, that seems like the elephant in the room. Like yourself, I hope that there's some unknown reason that these girls together just ran away and started a new life. And there is there is precedent for that. There are cases where people have just run away and, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the line, it's turned out that this person has appeared alive. But those are, unfortunately, I think, the exception. So, personally, I think it's most likely, unfortunately, that these, these girls, these women, are deceased, that they met an unfortunate end. I hope they didn't. But just looking at the balance of probabilities, unfortunately, I think that 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 military base, that that sheer concentration of young guys, someone someone there knows something. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it's it seems likely that well, you, somebody knows something. I know that there was a there was another case that was mentioned by some people about two young women who had driven a car uh -huh. along like a, like a country road. And they disappeared and it was years and years and years before they were found and then they discovered that the car was submerged. Yeah. Somewhere. Or they like crashed off the road into a river or something. Yeah. But the fact that they were the fact that they were walking, I mean, is that it has just occurred to me that I suppose you couldn't rule out that someone struck them on the road by accident yeah. and then panicked and put the bodies in the boot and drove off. There was that case in Scotland recently. Did you did you see that? No, no, I don't think so. There was a guy who was um Oh, is this a cyclist? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, it was a guy called Anthony or Tony Parsons who was a mm. who was a cyclist and if I remember correctly he was doing something for charity and two guys, it was a guy and his twin brother, I believe, collided with him while out like they were out driving. I don't know if they were drink driving or, or what. But they basically, they killed this guy while driving they hit his bike. He was cycling on the road. So it was up kind of in yeah. the highlands of Scotland in the kind of lower highlands north of Loch Lomond. And uh, they hit him, killed him. And then realizing they had killed this guy, thought, well, look, we can either hand we can either hand ourselves in as this is a, a terrible accident or we can get rid of the body. So they buried his body off the road somewhere. Yeah, okay, I found the BBC News story. A drink driver has admitted killing charity cyclist Tony Parsons and burying his body to cover up the crime. Alexander McKellar, 31, was speeding and had been drinking when he caused Mr Parsons' death. He and his twin brother Robert McKellar admitted trying to defeat the ends of justice by hiding the body in a grave in the Och estate near Bridge of Orkey in September 2017. Mr. Parsons' remains were not found until January 2021. Christ, that's like four years nearly. His family said it had been heartbreaking to live with so many unanswered questions over six years since he went missing. The High Court in Glasgow heard how Alexander McKellar collided with Mr. Parsons on the A82 between Bridge of Orkey and Tyndrum on the 29th of September 2017. Mr. McKellar did not seek medical assistance for the 63-year-old at the roadside. The damaged car involved in the killing was dumped at the nearby Och estate along with the brothers' phones. They then returned in a truck to where Mr. Parsons was still lying. He was placed into the vehicle along with his bike and other personal belongings. The brothers went back to the Och estate and initially hid Mr. Parsons' body in a part of the woods. He was later taken to another location used for, quote, the purposes of disposing dead animals. The brothers then dug a grave and buried Mr. Parsons along with his personal possessions. Prosecutor said the brothers got help trying to repair the car used in the killing, claiming it had been damaged when it hit a deer. The two men had been due to stand trial accused of Mr. Parsons' murder, but Alexander McKellar pled guilty to the reduced charge of culpable homicide. His brother had his not guilty plea to murder accepted. The pair both accepted attempting to defeat the ends of justice. Mr. Parson was last seen in September 2017 outside the Bridge of Orkey Hotel. He then continued cycling south on the A82 in the direction of Tyndrum, but there were no further sightings. Extensive searches were carried out in the area, involving local mountain rescue teams, volunteers, Police Scotland dogs and the Forces Air Support Unit. His remains were eventually found in a remote area in January 2021. Mr. Parsons' family were at the High Court in Glasgow to hear the guilty plea. In a statement, they described him as a much-loved husband, dad and granddad. They said, When he said goodbye and set off on his charity cycle from Fort William that Friday, none of us expected it to be the last time we would be able to see him or speak to him. Throughout the six years since he went missing, and then the subsequent criminal investigation, we had been left with many unanswered questions and it has been heartbreaking for each and every member of the family being unable to answer these questions. As you can imagine, not knowing what has happened to someone, and then the devastating news that we were provided has taken its toll on all of us as a family. So there we go. There's, there's an example of a case where yeah. someone essentially just walking on the road or cycling on the road has been wiped out and... Uh, someone has taken steps to cover that up so that's a possibility as well you know if we take away the possible sexual motive maybe they were just killed on the road and someone yeah. didn't want the legal consequences of that it's entirely possible but it's it's certainly a case that it's one of these ones the that you start off with and as tragic as it is there's not much information about it but then you, you get in deeper and deeper to it you realize there's so many different possibilities about what could have happened to them that you start to worry that they'll never really know the truth but you get the feeling either way someone knows yeah. someone knows something oh yeah and you just hope that there was an interesting interview that i saw and it was with one of the family members and i don't know if it was just the way the family member spoke about the case that gave the wrong impression but it sounded almost at one point 
in the quote as if they had an idea who who it might be. Really? They just started talking about the person who did this and that they've we hope, you know, they're holding this this terrible secret. And I, I don't know, there was something about the wording of it that I wonder if there's a suspicion about someone nearby and, and certainly there was that rumour about the two men burying the girls at the barn. So you don't know. But either way, it's just, it's tragic for the family and to, to go that length of time without knowing what happened, it's just, it's awful. So if anyone listening to this, I know it's a long shot, but has any information about it, there will be links. Yeah, the barn thing, if it's a teenage hangout, that does strike me as a bit of a red herring because where there are teenagers, there will be stories. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But anyway, I think, Martin, that as great as it's been, although as harrowing as it's been to discuss this topic, I think the sun is coming up. It's time to go. Are you just going to sit in silence and eat your quavers? I, I thought you were coming. I thought you were, sorry, I thought you were going to say something else <laughs> yes indeed um the sun is the sun is coming up i don't know i feel a bit bad saying the sun is coming up after such a dark and the sun is going down and, and <laughs> the the sun sun is, yeah the sun is melting into the darkness <laughs> the sun is never coming up again michael oh jesus christ martin right <laughs> thanks for listening everyone we'll see you in the next episode good night folks thanks for listening <laughs>